We're going to give it a few more minutes as we, we have people who are still waiting to enter, so uh, bear with us. But once everybody's uh, in and, and seated, we'll go ahead and kick it off. Thanks for your patience. No, actually, I, I well, I do, but I don't use it at all. So, I, 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 what's going on? I'm, I'm so bad about this. Oh, she told me that as I entered, but I, by the time I entered, it was too late. So, yeah, no, I appreciate that. I know I picked the wrong day to get an overview. So. <laughs> Yeah, no, I appreciate that. I know I could go on day to go over Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
I understand when we've got people entering. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. We, we're not about to start yet, but please, if you have any questions, Alex is going to pick up the court, pick up the sticky notes, and we're going to post them on the board. So we need you to ask some questions. I only see four sticky notes on that on that board over there. This is a community town hall meeting. That means that we come to collect come together collectively to look at some of these issues in our community. So please ask some questions. The sticky notes is over to the side if you don't have them. Raise your hand and we get somebody to bring you a sticky note if you need to ask a question. That means that we come together collectively to look at some of these issues in our community. So please ask some questions. The sticky notes is over to the side if you don't have them. Raise your hand and we get somebody to bring you a sticky note if you need to ask a question. The sticky notes is over to the side if you don't have them. Raise your hand if we get somebody to bring you a sticky note if you need to ask a question. Good evening. I really uh, want to begin by thanking all of you for coming out. Uh, this is a really important opportunity for all of us as a community to come together in this time when our entire city, our entire community Good evening. is mourning over the death of Aria Jackson. And we mourn not only for Aria, who as a seven-year-old girl was the most innocent of innocents, but for her entire family, for her friends, uh, and for everyone in our community who's been so deeply impacted by this tragedy. I also want to uh, begin by acknowledging some of the elected officials who are here. First and foremost, I want to acknowledge my friend and city councilwoman, Mel Rutherford.
And City Councilwoman, I know that this tragedy hits you particularly hard. Uh, this, like so much of the senseless violence in our community has disproportionately affected District 1, the district that you represent in the city. I know that you for many years have been on the front lines of combating this kind of senseless violence. So thank you for your service. Thank you for your service over many years, but, but now especially as such a wonderful city councilwoman. I also want to acknowledge uh, the president of the Pontiac School Board, Gil Garrett, who is uh, here as well. Thank you, my friend Gil, for being here. And I also want to recognize Anisha Hanna, who is not only a school board trustee, but on the front lines in many ways, including with the Pontiac Collective Impact Partnership. So thank you, Anisha, for all of you. Are there any other Mr. Parker, but I'm, I'm waiting because I'm going to be introducing him to do the invocation. But I'll also acknowledge Pastor Parker, who's a city councilman, as well as William Carrington. We'll be hearing from them uh, in greater detail soon. But I'll also note that William Carrington is not just a councilman, but the president pro tem of council uh, as well. We're, we're here really with, with a few objectives in mind. First, and foremost, we need to send a clear message. We need to set a clear norm that we are not going to tolerate violence, that we're not gonna to tolerate any violence, but especially violence as brutal and senseless as the murder of a seven-year-old girl in our community. We are not going to accept this as business as usual in Pontiac. We are not going to turn the other way and live our lives like nothing happened here when this has gone on for far, far too long in our city. And it is not acceptable. It is not business as usual. We're not going to accept it as something that just goes on in the course of our everyday lives. It's got to stop. And it's got to stop now, and it must stop here. And this is part of us coming together as a community to clearly communicate that this is unacceptable. But it's also important that as we chart a path forward, because we're here not just because of the tragic murder of Aria Jackson, but we're here because this has been a pattern for many years in the community but unfortunately, already this year, we've had at least four homicides in just the first two and a half months of 2022. So the problem seems to be accelerating, and we need to make sure that we're charting a path forward that's not just about a law enforcement response, although I appreciate the importance of law enforcement. Yes, it's essential, and I want to thank our uh, sheriffs, deputies, and leadership who are here in attendance for their service. But a law enforcement response alone is not going to solve this problem. We've got to make sure that we're putting in place more early interventions that will prevent conflict from spiraling out of control and becoming and turning into violence in the first place. And that's why we're so thrilled by the community partners that we have here with us. I know that our moderators are going to be introducing them, but we have community partners here who have been doing this work, trying to make sure that we diffuse conflicts before they turn violent in the community. And they're going to continue to be in the trenches doing that work. We're going to give each of them an opportunity to speak, but we need more of those early interventions. And I'm working closely with the city council to appoint an anti-violence commission that will be looking at more innovative ways that we can intervene early. They're going to be uh, a standing work group for the foreseeable future to start implementing some of those strategies. And ultimately, it's up to all of us as community members, as community leaders, to prevent this kind of senseless violence, these senseless acts from occurring again. And that's why we want to hear from you. Uh, we need your input about what the best path forward is. We want your ideas. We want your input. And we want to make sure that we're hearing your questions so that we can provide answers and be as transparent as possible. We also want to give you an opportunity to grieve and to be heard if, if you're interested in expressing your grief publicly this evening as well. 
And so without uh, further ado, let's, let's kick off the substance of tonight's program. Uh, we're honored to have two wonderful moderators with us, William Carrington, who, as I said, is the council president pro tem, and Tamika Ramsey, who's a longtime community activist who's been doing this hard work for many, many years. And before we turn the podium over to them, I want to welcome city councilman and pastor William Parker to the podium to lead us in prayer. Good afternoon, Saints. Good afternoon, Saints. Good afternoon. Let us pray. Precious God, our Father, we come yet again this day thanking you for your many blessings. Thanking you, Lord God, for your patience, your love, your kindness, your understanding, your favor that you keep pouring out on each and every one of us. We acknowledge and recognize your sovereignty. We recognize, dear Lord, that you are the creator of all things that ever was or ever will be. We who are your handmade servants, Lord God, have come this day, God, just to say thank you for the process and the, the presence of forgiveness in our lives. We haven't done it the way you told us to do it, Lord God, and for that we truly are sorry. We ask now in the name of Jesus, dear Lord, that you would just forgive us for all of our sins, transgressions, trespasses, and iniquities that we have committed against you and against your word. We stand now, the Lord, in the name of Jesus, asking that as we have come together, Lord God, to address the issues that are prevalent in our community, we ask for your guidance. We ask for your leadership. We ask for your direction. And more importantly, Lord God, we ask that you would build a hedge and a shield of protection around our city and around our young, all of our young ones, Lord, dear Lord. In the name of Jesus, Lord Lord, we ask that you would shield them and keep them in the hollow of your hand, that you would continue, Lord God, to give those who you have placed in leadership wisdom and direction to be able to do that which is pleasing in your sight and lead this city forward to that place where you would have them to be. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. And all the saints of God said, amen, 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 amen. and amen. amen. Good evening, everyone. A violent crime occurs every 24.6 seconds in America. 24, six seconds in America, someone commits a violent crime. We currently live in a society that is based on violence, a culture of violence in America. City of Pontiac and various cities across America is a result of a violent American culture which we live in. So today, I thank each and every one of you for coming and attending this. It's an emergency in our community. It's an emergency in our community. This city has been in mourning too long. So today, we're gonna have some objectives. We're not just gonna get passionate and go home. We're gonna, we're gonna get passionate and have action tonight. Yes. We're gonna heal this community and make this community better for every one of our citizens. So definitely I support the mayor's um, call to action as well as the city council's call to action. So today, we're gonna have some objectives. We're going to end up and identify the root causes of violence in our city. This is a great city. We're going to establish a, a city anti-violence task force leading forward. We go, we're going to put these words tonight into action. Also, we're going to talk about creating block clubs and neighborhood associations to help uh, reduce crime in our neighborhoods. So I'm going to turn it over to uh, Mr. Mika Ramsey. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. So tonight we are here not only to talk, but to do. But we also have to do some self-reflecting. The police, the, the organization of the police by design is reactive. If a crime happens, we have an amazing sheriff's department that is to our doors within minutes. 
but who is responsible for the prevention? Each one of us. So today we're going to have some courageous and difficult conversations because we're not just going to be pointing the finger at other people. We are going to be looking at how do we as individuals, as family members, as community members, help hold people accountable that's, go that, that's creating these horrible things in the city. We cannot say what more can the sheriffs do because they were there within minutes to help that family. But what can we do to stop those things from even happening in the first place? So as we're talking today, think about that. And we have some amazing community organizations that we are going to really push you to be a part of because they are actually doing the work on the ground. We are excited to have Delia Sharp from Identify Your Dreams. Many of you have heard of her because she has been on the ground for years working with children of murdered parents, helping their families. And the fact that the, her, her caseload and her membership is only growing just tells you about the violence that is happening. We have Norbert Burroughs with I Am The Village, and I am excited to hear what he has to say because he puts the responsibility solely where it belongs, and that's with us with each one of us and what are we doing to make sure that we're holding our family members accountable. We also have Raheem Harris with Pontiac Universal Crimes. The fact that he wants to do work that is proactive, block clubs, working with other organizations, but can only do vigils and marches because violence continues to happen is a problem. We also have Samino Scott, with the Pontiac Collective Impact Partnership, who are spreading resources around the city, giving the organizations what they need to help us stop and deter violence. And then we have Pastor Jones from the Oakland County Ministerial Fellowship, as well as pastor at Welcome Church, because it takes all of us. And once again, in communities of color, we go to the churches for resources. And communities in general, we go to our synagogues and our mosques for safety. And these are the people that will help move us forward. And with that, I will turn it over. We are giving everybody six minutes to talk about your organization and what you're doing and how people can tap into your organization. We also have sign-in sheets in the back where if you are interested, you can just check a box by your name and says, I wanna be a part of these organizations and then they will follow up with you. So with that, I am going to turn it over to Ms. Leah Sharp. You have six minutes. You can stay there, your mic is on, um, but we do have a timer. I don't wanna be rude, <laughs> but we will be, Delia, okay? All right, thank you. Good evening. So first I want to say, um, as long as there is someone left to say a person's name, that spirit will continue. So if everybody can say after me, Araya Jackson. Keep that name on our lips to allow that young spirit to live on. I'm actually here representing two organizations that I hold leadership roles for. Both are equally invested in the work we're talking about today. First, I am the executive director for Identify Your Dream, where we offer grief support. Through that, we, um, through referrals, we're introduced to families with children that are 4 to 18 years old who have lost a loved one to violence. Each child will receive a IDYD grief grief relief kit and also be invited to our 12-week mentoring program where they learn the stages of grief, how to properly grieve, channel their energy from grief into greatness. We also connect them with mentors in the community and together they complete a dream project. We also provide case management through that you know, because oftentimes when there's a, there is a domino effect, when a family suffers a violent loss, priorities shift. Financial obligations like bills, rent, and maybe even food get benched due to the financial bind of their new reality. And lastly, we provide victim advocacy where we have attended court hearings and also submitted, letter, submitted letters on behalf of some of the families we serve. 
I am also the chapter coordinator for a national organization called Crime Survivors for Safety and Justice, where we're building a movement to heal together and promote public safety policies that help the people and communities most harmed by crime and violence. We see far too often where legislators are making and shaping policies that are directly impacting crime survivors, but never give the, them a seat at the table to discuss exactly what they need. We are tired of the billions of dollars that are used to incarcerate black and brown people with very little effort towards rehabilitation and recovery. Even with the current system that were set in place to bring up about safer communities, we understand that that's flawed. As we're here today, this vicious cycle of crime is going strong in the city and we're desperately in a need of a radical change. As I glance across this room, I see familiar faces, I see organizers, I see leaders in the communities that I can count on to always step up when crises rise up. I think I've said this, this, this same thing a few years ago. We had the same town hall meeting, I don't know how many years ago, and I said, how do we engage the disengaged? Those voices that we really do need to hear from. I remember the last town hall meeting, I believe it was Q, that said he could have 50 um, neighborhood guys come into the next meeting. That next meeting did not happen. So what I will make sure that we do is be consistent this time and hold us accountable if we don't. Um, excuse me. But even in my program, I know Tamika talked about, you know, it's growing. It is. But we don't have a lot of families that's bringing their kids to a support group for grieving children. I actually had a grandmother say to me that she really wanted her grandkids to be in IDYD, but because they live with the father after the mother was murdered, he just don't get it. And so the kids have never attended. Because when you're dealing with violence, um, it can be a personal thing. And so a lot of people are not ready to go um, or not, they don't see the need for vigils. They don't see the need for stump out violence marches because their violence to them is personal and a lot of them deal with it inside their home. And just a, just a personal uh, story, we dealt with that privately. My brother, uh, was, my brother actually was shot at 16 years old over a starter jacket. He didn't die. He, um, he got shot over a starter jacket. And so we, my brother was cared for. He came home. We dealt with it privately. Six years later, that same brother was shot and killed. And I actually did not know that, there, that there's a high statistics rate that says that a person that gets shot, they could possibly get shot again. There's a program um, in Detroit that has bedside therapy. And so after the victim is cared for, after they stabilize the victim, they immediately call the program um, director and he comes in and has bedside therapy. And that is reducing retaliation and also reducing them getting back out into that same life that, they, that brought them there in the first place. And so I often wonder if we had had some type of support or some type of intervention or some type of therapy would my brother still be here today? And so that's my, that's why I'm here. That's why I want to be in this conversation because I want to talk about that and make sure that we understand that we can come here every single time that a, a murder happens and it's the same people that I see. But if we don't engage the disengage, that cycle is going to continue. Thank you, Ms. Sharp. It is often said in our community that we are a village. And that's the philosophy that I grew up with and growing up in Flint, Michigan. We are a village. So I bring to you someone that has made his, his mission to say, I am the village, Mr. Norbert Burroughs. <laughs> um, let me first, uh, Thank everyone for uh, 
Uh, keep up the good work. Uh, Norbert, you should run for council. Norbert, you should run for mayor. Norbert, you should run for something. Um, I've been running all along. Like, I've been helping so many organizations, um, I, all of them. I, I always volunteer my time with all different organizations. And while I'm, while I'm doing that, volunteering my time, I appreciate them letting me volunteer with them. But it's always like a little thing that says, like, you know what, I love what they're doing, but I would have added this. Or I would have maybe brought this person in. But me, I'm volunteering, so I can't tell them how to run their organizations. But what I can do is kind of work on trying to implement those things that I had in mind. And that's where I'm the village come in at. Back in 2016, we had this same type of meeting, a state of emergency meeting. And back then, we figured out what we needed to do. Turns out we needed, we came up with a youth center. Let's try to get a youth center, get these kids off the streets, and, and we'll move on from there. That didn't quite happen. So right now, the reason why I decided to get the, the village back going, it's now a foundation now. So now I have help. I have support. I have support of the mayor. I have support of the sheriffs. I have support of Identify Your Dreams. I have support of uh, uh, Pontiac Universal Crimes, T. Ramsey and Associates. I have support of all these people up here so that I can help y'all, so I can help our city. And one of the things is, it's so many organizations out here that's catering to the youth. That's catering to the youth. A million of them. But guess what? It don't make any sense. We can have our youth in all kinds of organizations from when they get out of school at 3 until 9 o'clock at night. But guess what? We're not doing them any good if we're sending them to that bold environment at home. They go into the bold and we help them. We, we, we shared all this positivity to these kids all day. But when 8 o'clock, 8.30 come, now they back at home to that same bull. So now we got to focus on us now for the adults. So I'm here speaking for if you between the age of 36 and maybe 60, it's us. We the ones who are failing our kids. Because we can keep pointing, talk about these little and we these little kids, they bad and all this. We got to talk about us. And if you grew up when the era I grew up, the first thing you're going to say is, uh, when I grew up, my parents didn't do this. My parents didn't allow that. When I grew up, the neighbor did this, the neighbor did that. But guess what we doing? We talking because we not doing it. We not showing them what our parents did. We telling them, but we not showing them. So as of tonight, I need help. I got help from these folks here. Anything I need to share with all of them, they, they support me. I need your help now. I need y'all to be part of the village to help me get this thing going like it's supposed to. And, and speaking of the sheriffs, I've been in a 10 week program working with the sheriffs. I've been in, in, in simulation thing. I, I'm, I'm learning everything they learning. So y'all talk about crime. Where's the sheriffs? The sheriff's job is not to prevent the crime. It's not. That's our job. You know what the sheriff's job is? To respond to it. So y'all want to sit here and say, where's the sheriffs? So when the sheriffs do come and they patrolling and all of that, then it's like, oh, they're here and they're harassing us. So which way you want it? Do you want their help or not? But when they do come help, that's why I'm in the training. Because we're not going to allow anything to happen. I'm not. So I want to see it through their lens when they do start coming. But I want y'all to know this. When the police come, let me give y'all an example. When y'all go to Detroit, y'all think about Detroit. How many of y'all go to Detroit and say, you know what? I'm not stopping at the gas station. Raise your hand if you say I ain't going to stop at the gas station. Why not? It's a high crime area, right? It's high crime. For those who do stop at the gas station, when y'all raise your hand when y'all stop at the gas station, y'all be like, I'm ready. I'm ready. I'm ready. Now, 
Pontiac, all these murders, Pontiac is labeled as a high crime city. High crime. So the police, just like we are at the gas station, when they come in in a high crime area, they ready. They ready. And all types of things can happen. So that's why we got to build that relationship too with them. If y'all don't want to deal with the sheriffs, let's turn this, let's, let's, let's get erase this high crime. They don't have to come on every time it's a murder or crime. They could be in here just enjoying themselves. So my organization is starting to help the adults. I'm talking about clearing up that, that, that going home to that mess, the environment, and which is, it could be hunger, it could be housing, which is important. Landlords, hey listen, I only had six minutes, I'll see y'all on live. I got a lot more to talk about. Thank you. Brother Norbert talked about a concept of sociology uh, when it comes to the agents of sociology where he talked about family structure. Family structure is the first and most important agent of socialization. So if your family is not rooted with norms and values, the children grow up without norms and values in their family structure. And everything after that, whether it's education, whether it's the social peer, the peer, group, the peer groups, have, somehow, somehow it's hard to engage those kids at that time, right? So thank you for, for talking about that family as one of the most important structures in our society. He also talked about police, community policing. It's imperative that we work with our sheriff's department. It's imperative that we work with our sheriff's department. They're not all bad people at all. I've been in trouble with the police, and I've been told I've done a good job from the police. <laughs> and everybody that knows my story know I've been a bad person in my youth. But at the same time, they didn't give up on me, or my family didn't give up on me. So I was able to come up out of where I was and change up my direction. I put the guns down. You know, I thought that I had to, I had to ride around town always strapped when I was growing up. I also thought that I'd rather get caught with it than without it in my neighborhood. Because I wasn't afraid, but I didn't want to get shot. So I wanted to protect myself. So again, we have to look at our family structures and start building programs that strengthen our families. Start building programs that strengthen our families. So I'm gonna call an, a, another young man up from Pontiac Universal Crimes, Mr. Raheem Harris. I, and his work involves a lot of pos, positive things, but at the same time, we come together to mourn. We have to stop that. I know this brother don't, don't want to see those, vi those vigils of someone getting murdered in our community. So again, I'm gonna give you the floor, sir. Good afternoon, everyone. I am Raheem Harris with Pontiac Universal Crimes. I fight this gun violence out here. I'm not here to talk, okay? I'm not here to get no speech, all right? I wanna get in all your hearts for that young lady sitting over there and for every last one of these mothers that are out here that's dealing with this violence in the pen that are dealing with this violence. I hold every last one of y'all accountable. And I mean it. It's no more playing. Pontiac, it's no more playing on our watch. I'm serious. We got too many, too many, too many respectful people that grew up in our neighborhood. We all came from the South. I'm gonna tell y'all about Pontiac, okay? This is serious. 
We got to take care of our people. We got to take care of our kids. I understand the game when our young man's out here, okay? I don't do the visuals for them because I understand what is the streets is. I do it for y'all, for every last one of y'all, because y'all don't deserve it. Y'all don't deserve it. This violence that's happening in our city, y'all don't deserve that. None of y'all don't deserve it. I'm gonna tell y'all a story because I don't want to talk. I want to hear y'all heart. And I want y'all to take a vow tonight that we're going to stop this violence, that we all going to make a vow in our heart that it's going to be serious. Every last one of our council members, every last one of our leaders, we got to help them. We got to help them. They can't do it all by themselves. And y'all gonna hear that more than one time up here. They can't do it by themselves. Okay? And when they're doing their job, respect them while they do their job. Because this is a hard job out here. It's a hard job dealing with these people out here because they are our people. We love them. Them are our people out there that's doing this violence. We got the love on them. I'm serious, y'all. This ain't no game. This is serious. Let me tell y'all a story how Pontiac Universal Crime started in 2015. A young man by Lina Joyner was killed. His mother was going door to door asking, who killed my baby? Everybody was looking at her like she was crazy. That woman was a person like every last one of you, a respectful citizen in our city. And that wasn't gonna happen no more. So that's how Pontiac Universal Crime started because we wanted these guns out of the streets. We always say, put the guns down. We didn't put the guns down. Ain't nobody said it with me. Nobody said it. Ain't nobody said put these guns down and meant it. Y'all got to mean it when you say it. Don't go in your house after this and just go watch your TV, your big screen. Don't do that. Don't do that and I mean it. Take a vow to put the boots on the ground. After the night, enough is enough. We got a baby That's, that passed away. I want y'all to remember forever seven. Forever seven. Forever seven. Say it. Forever seven. Forever seven. Forever seven. Forever seven. Forever seven. Y'all better cut this out playing this. All of y'all, and I mean it. After the night, take it serious in your heart. Because Forever 7 didn't, she didn't deserve this. She didn't deserve this, y'all. And y'all all better be in the uproar. The brother talked about self-accountability. He, he, he had a call to action that we have to get involved in our community. We all have to be engaged to put the guns down, right? So again, I thank you, brother, for that call to action. Pontiac Collective Impact Partnership, Dr. Samino Scott. I see this brother, someone, I, I watched him as he went through his uh, PhD program. And uh, we talked, well, I was going through the same, or a different program, but we was both going through our PhD program. Uh, and he was a very positive young man when I met this young man. So it's an honor to have you come to this uh, podium, sir. It's an honor. Also, before we begin, also, please fill out some question cards. We have a long night, so I want to make sure that uh, we definitely are able to get some information from this community and what do you need to know and how we can move this city forward. So please continue to fill out some question cards. Good evening. Good 
I'm honored to be here today to talk about violence. And Trustee Carrington, you know, just highlighted the fact that today I'm a doctor. But 30 years ago, I was a delinquent youth running the city of Pontiac sitting in Oakland County Children's Village, selling drugs in our community, carrying guns. I was a part of the problem. And I think that, you know, one thing that we have to realize is that our youth haven't reached that point of actualization where they really understand the impact of their decisions. And it's our responsibility, as has been said so many times here, to make them aware of the opportunities that are in front of them and really save their life. So, you know, when I think about the times that I ran the street of Pontiac, I was careless. In many regards, I was reckless. And as a result of that, I have many friends that have lost their life. In fact, my one of my very best friends was shot in the back of the head on Michigan as he was driving. And his car ultimately hit the side of a house. And that's where we found his body. And that was 27 years ago. And that changed my life forever. I don't, I don't know that I, I really experienced death the same since that time. And so when we talk about our youth today, oftentimes I hear us say, well, you know, they're far worse than we were. No, they're not. We were doing the same thing 30 years ago. And Mayor Grimo touched on it when he said that this is a pattern of historic proportion. And we have a responsibility to address it, to understand it, and to give back to our youth. And so when I think about wrapping my mind around the violence that's occurring today, it really it, it makes me think about some of the work of a sociologist, uh, Carl Thomas, out of uh, Michigan State. And Carl Thomas grew up in Detroit. He did his sociological research in Detroit, and he talked a lot about the third city. And for those of you who are not aware of the third city, the third city is as real as any third world country. But it's more. It's an intercourse of eco structures that society would most commonly label the underground or underworld. And I think many of us could understand it contextualized that way. The reality is that the third world is, amal is an amalgamation of street and mainstream culture, which has a hybrid system of mixed values, ideas, and beliefs. And I think you heard that already. Sociological analysis reveal the host of a divergent intersection exists in the third city. These intersections are constructed from variables such as poverty, violence, crime, drugs, ignorance, and illicit enterprise. The third city is the city where people live in a community largely controlled and affected by an underground culture or underworld society. The people in the third city don't govern themselves by common laws. So when we see behavior that many of us think is unbelievable, it's actually rational behavior when you think about the code that they live that exists in the streets. And so as the leader of an organization that focuses on reducing violent crimes, I'm wholeheartedly in support of the organizations that are here today. And many of you that are sitting beyond the table. As Norbert indicated, I'm also a part of the community policing and education series with the Oakland County Sheriff. And I believe that it is paramount that we begin to change the dynamic of how we interact with the police. The sheriffs had nothing to do with the most recent crime that Raheem talked about, the murder of that seven-year-old child. That's us. That's us. 
And so I believe that everyone in this effort should first look in the mirror when we think about how can we resolve the violent crimes that are taking place in our community. And when we do, we have to begin to think about what each one of us can do. And so our role at the Pontiac Collective Impact Partnership is not to create new initiatives, but to work collaboratively with organizations that are already doing the work and figure out how can we scale those things that are effective and how can we combine our efforts to move these efforts forward to impact our community in a positive way. And so those of you that are interested in learning more about the Pontiac Collective Impact Partnership and what we do, I inv invite you to visit our website. Just Google our name, you'll find us. But we welcome your participation and uh, I'm just delighted to see so many of you here today. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Samino Scott. I felt like I was just in the classroom all over again. <laughs> The brother talked talk about a third city. But when we think about other theories or other sociological theories, we talk about also a, a cultural property. And a cultural property reinforces those negative values that are spared out of not being able to have decent resources. A cultural property states that these negative values are passed down from one generation to the next due to a community not having enough resources to just survive which also impacts and builds the third city, which the, the doctor was talking about. So as we continue, I want to bring to the podium someone um, that I, I dearly love, someone that I admire from afar at times, someone who usually gets my name wrong. <laughs> he usually called me Harrington instead of Carrington, but I'm going to forgive him. <laughs> Doc. Mr. Uh, Douglas Jones, Pastor Douglas Jones. Let me take the, let me thank this group first for all of what you're doing today. Uh, you know, I've had an opportunity to talk with you all and I will continue to do that because this is so important, you know, with around the wall or wherever, individually and collectively. But I also want to um, introduce, and I'm going to ask these pastors if they would to stand. Hopefully I didn't miss any of them. I'm going to call you out by name. Pastor Chris Johnson from the Episcopal Church. Pastor Yolanda Whiting from Newman AME Church. <laughs> Pastor William Parker of New Springfield Baptist Church. To lead. <laughs> Pastor Aaron Robinson from the Power Company Kids. <laughs> Pastor John Gunn, Power Company Kids. Pastor John Tolbert, Trinity Church. <laughs> Pastor Laura Kelsey, First Presbyterian Church. <laughs> Minister Kevin Sanders, Boulevard Church. <laughs> Minister Thurman Cogdell, Welcome Baptist Church. <laughs> Minister Kermit Williams, New Mount Moriah Church. <laughs> Bishop Teresa Lee of New Birth Church. <laughs> I'm thankful for them. And just their presence really answers the question. People say, where are the pastors? Where are the pastors? The pastors are here and they've always been here. And they continue to do the job. A lot of people don't understand, don't understand what you do, why you do. I could tell you the limited amount of time, rest, that many of these pastors have. People say they're not doing enough, but they are doing enough. 
they are doing enough and they're out there. They're there when you're not. I can't tell you the number of calls that I've called out on as chaplain. Not just for the members of, I don't think I've been for any member of my church yet, but for the kids or for other officers, the pastors are there. A lot of times in this community, and in several communities, they say, where are the pastors? Oh, the pastors, where are the pastors? The pastors are there and they're working, even in spite of what people say. In spite of what people say. And so when we come into an issue like this today, and I called the mayor, I was very upset about it. Very upset. But even in issues like this today, the first thing people come to me and say is, what's wrong with the parents? And that's what's here. Yeah. What's wrong with the parents? Well, what's wrong with them is they say they're not going to bring their kids up like their parents brought them up in church. Most of us in here that were brought up in church said what I did not ever want was my mama to give me the look. <laughs> or to have to go down the street, and I'm going to give you this example to go down the street and do something and go home. And by the time you got home, your mama knew. And to try to get yourself out of it, you said, mama, I didn't do that. And she said, are you calling them a lie? <laughs> because parents had a role. Parents had a role, and that's one of the big issues today. And, and I think I heard it. Ownership. Ownership. Amen. Ownership. A lot of parents are grieving. I agree with them. We're still trying to figure some things out. Parents who lost their children. This was a seven-year-old child. Seven-year-old child is in the reading program, March reading. Seven-year-old child. This life was taken away without a chance. Your memory will live forever and we'll never forget it. Because every March in reading month, we're going to remember this child. Twelve-year-old young man, football player, young football player. I could go through the list. Kid after kid after kid. Kid after kid. I talked to Raheem about his grandchild. First friend I called him. I said, how you doing? How you holding up? I'm going through grief myself. Most of you know. Lost wife. Lost my daughter. Going through it. But have not had the time I don't even know if there's time because of the need for others. So this ownership. When I called the mayor, I said, I tell you what, Mr. Mayor, enough is enough. Enough is enough. Drive-bys in any neighborhood is a drive-by in every neighborhood. Amen. No neighborhood is free. None. No, if it's not in yours today to be there tomorrow. And so it's very, very important that we collectively come together and say enough is enough. enough, is enough. We're going to speak up and we're going to speak out. Yes. And we got to just start saying, you're, you're not going to do this in my neighborhood. Yes. Amen. You are not going to do this in my neighborhood. Yes. You are not going to do it. No more. In my neighborhood, enough. It's enough. 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 I said to the young lady today, yes, we'll, we'll have a service at the church. Yes. We're going to do it. We're going to do it. I don't know if that'll give her relief. Come on. But we're going to do it. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you. Thank you. It's not about snitching, right? 
I'm from the east side of Pontiac, born and raised. I know the definition of snitching, <laughs> right? And so I tell people, if Raheem and I are doing a crime together and we get caught, and I tell on Raheem in order to lessen my punishment, I'm snitching. I, that. I don't respect right. that, but that's snitching. It's over. But if I'm in the community and I look out my window and I see somebody being hurt and I call the police, I'm being a responsible community member. <laughs> it's a difference. And so we always talk about snitch and snitch. No, no, it is stopping unnecessary violence. Mm -hmm. It is keeping our community safe. We have children and grandchildren and siblings, nieces and nephews that live here that we want to protect. It's not snitching. We also want to talk and listen and hear from the community. We have two community members here, right? A young black man, an older black woman, right? Who are living, who have lived through most of this and have seen things and have concerns. And what are we doing for them? So first I would like to welcome up Vera Curry, right? As most of y'all know, that's my mama. <laughs> we moved to Spring Lake Village when I was four years old. My mother still lives there. And every year I'd be like, can you move? Cause I'm scared for her. I'll call her and check on her and she'll say, yeah, they were shooting, but I laid on the floor. Like, no, that, that's, not a, that's not the way to handle it. The police come, nobody says who was shooting. I don't want to get a call that says your mother was hit by a bullet in her house because guns don't have a name, they don't have an address, and they once they are out of the gun, we cannot control where they go. But she is in there and she looks after these young kids that are always outside playing. This baby, this seven-year-old baby was getting home from school. That's it. Her crime was getting out of a car. How many of us could have had that, could have been their child? We don't know. That bullet wasn't meant for her, but that's who got it. Where are the people who did it? Who's talking? Mm -hmm. So we have people from the community, Vera, if you can please come up, who want and understand the need to protect their community. We also have Perry Earl, who is a young man with beautiful young children who wants to stay in Pontiac and raise his kids, but he don't want nothing to happen to them. And everybody always talking about you moving out of Pontiac. I need my kids to live. I need to stay alive. And so we can't blame people for leaving to protect themselves, but what we can do is make this community a place where people can stay and be protected. And so I am going to give Miss Curry. <laughs> yes. Yes. Just a minute to talk about you. You don't have to talk right now. Right now. You want to pull it? Mm -mm. Okay, go ahead. Hi, I'm Vera. I stay in Spring Lake. I look out for the little kids. I see the guns coming. I call the parents, tell them, get your kids in the house. That's all I can do. I call the police, but they be them left because they don't stay in our neighborhood. They come to our neighborhood. So that's all I can do. And I try to protect them. That's why I'm staying there. So, <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> want my mama to move out of Spring Lake, right? I'd be worried. Um, we're also now going to have Perry Earl come up and just talk about his experience. Once again, we, we, we keep talking about growing our city, right? Bringing young families here, but who in their right mind would bring their children here, right? And not know if their child will be getting home or going to school and make it. Thank you, Perry. Good evening, everybody. I'm Perry Earl Jr. How y'all doing tonight? So I was going to say something else, and then I thought about it, like, what was I doing at 7? Like, think about that for a minute. What was you doing at 7 in Pontiac? Like, when I was 7, I could ride my bike to any side of town. My mama can call the neighborhood and see where I'm at. 
You know, that's the kind of Pontiac I grew up in. Um, another thing, and I hope Samino don't mind if I share this. Um, one time me and Samino was on the east side of Pontiac and we got called to a neighbor's house to handle a situation. Now it's a bunch of kids versus wiser, wiser generation. Let me say that. <laughs> and, um, you know, it's probably like 10 of them, 12 of them. And it's just two people that stay in the house across the street. So, you know, me and Samino was there for protection. The police came um, and we kind of like helped that situation. Um, and that kind of got me thinking like the village, you know, shout out to Nora Ribeiro's. Like it take a village to raise all of us. And we don't have that anymore in the city of Pontiac. And I think that we need that. I think these kids deserve that. And yeah, we don't got community centers, but me and my friend, Sean Preston, we in the park with the kids. Come see us at the park. You know, it ain't nothing wrong with that. You know, we can't continue to make excuses. You know, we gotta come together. You know, so what's your shoes better than mine? So what's your car better than mine? None of that matters. We got these young, my, I gotta, my kids, man, what? <laughs> yeah, anyway, but yeah, my, like, <laughs> you know, this, this shouldn't have happened. I see this young girl in the crowd. I see these young kids in the crowd. Like, we need more for these kids to do. If the preacher's here, I mean, man, we got so many buildings. Open them up and let these kids in them. You know, let's not just wait on a community center. You know, if you have a building, if you have a place, if you got somewhere for these kids to do, teach them. These kids got PPP loans and bought guns. We got Norval Barrel, Sean, we got Shanti. They could have taught them how to buy a house or build their credit with that money. You know, and and... It ain't the police fault because they always say it's a white and black thing. Well, here in this community, it's a culture thing. You know, these sheriffs that we got now, they don't know nothing about our culture in this in Pontiac. And they ain't that fault. They fought. Somebody need to educate them. But, you know, we ain't taking the time out to do that. You know, I see Gil Gear riding. I see my man. I don't know his name in the back. I see Sergeant Troy. I see them all the time in my community. You know, I see see them hollering at kids, taking the time out. Back in the day, we used to play one on one with the cops on Perkins Street, you know, Justin Street, on Osmond Street. That was cool. We knew the mayor. The mayor was in our community. He was coming to have talks at our schools. He was coming to like, where is that at? And I'm so sick and tired of hearing people saying that the kids is much bigger now. We scared of them. Like half of us in this room is about that life. Yeah. <laughs> Come on, man. Come on, so we saw about that life. Let's go back and get our kids. Yeah. Let's go back and fight for these streets. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it's nothing wrong with us organizing. You know, I wish I would, I could see more people my age. Mm -hmm. I'm 30, I know I look young, but <laughs> <laughs> more <Yeah>. people my, <laughs> more people my age in this room because it's really us. We gotta come together. And we got to take our streets back. But it's a gap. It's a bridge. It's, and when you cross that bridge, you got the wiser generation and you got the younger kids. And it's this middle. How do we meet? And we Because y'all got the experience. It's like playing basketball. When you get too old, you ain't got no knees no more. You need the young blood to pass the ball to the assist. Yeah. <laughs> Stop being stingy with the knowledge and pass it on. It ain't nothing wrong with passing the baton. You know, that. Right. yeah, so, you know, I want to keep this going. Um, my name is Perry Earl Jr. on everything. So if you want to find me, I'm always, lately I've been missing, but um, I'm here. I'm back. I'm here. So if you want to do something, let's organize, let's make it happen. We got all these organizations here. They serious. I've been knowing, I didn't did stuff with all these people. We didn't took back our, I didn't took back my community with all these people. I didn't stump the violence with all these people, you know? So let's just make sure this don't happen again. You know, open your mouth. Some of y'all don't know what y'all kids be doing. That's, that's okay, pay close attention. But if some people that know what your kids doing, open up your mouth. Say something to the parents. Or holler at the big daddies and the big GGs. I know we, there's a shortage on that, but it's some in the family that ain't afraid to say something. So thank you, that's my time. Thank you. So we have questions and we are going to go ahead and start 
what we did was, in case you did not hear your specific question, we grouped the light questions um, just so we can make sure that we hit everything. Um, and then we're going to call specifically on the person or organization that would be best to answer that question. One of the first question, um, we're going to call them call Mayor Grimal. Can the city work with businesses to, do, to donate ring doorbells? That's a great idea. Um, and uh, it's not something I, I heard before. And it's a, it's a great example of why we're doing this event tonight, because we want to hear those kinds of suggestions. And the answer is yes. Uh, we absolutely can. And, uh, you know, the more we can have devices like that at doors, uh, the more likely I think we are to prevent some some criminal acts, acts of violence, uh, but also the more likely we are to catch perpetrators of those acts. So it's a really great uh, suggestion, whoever made it, and we'll definitely follow up on that. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mayor Grimal. Mr. Delia Sharp, at what age should we start investing in our children? Yes, in the womb. <laughs> we can answer that together. <laughs> okay, I guess that's a community question. <laughs> and, and, it, and it's an age-appropriate investment. So you, there's stages to that investment, if that's to be specific with that. Thank you. Dr. Semino, Dr. Semino uh, Scott, how can community health and service providers support this issue? By reaching out to parents, making sure that, um, you know, as we just talked about in the room, that our kids are born the appropriate developmental level. Please use your mics. Thank you. I think with respect to healthcare professionals, the main thing is that we want to make sure that every one of our children are born um, with the appropriate developmental level so that when they start school that they're not behind. One of the um, research projects that I participated in, I interviewed a group of young men. And one of those young men had excessive behavioral problems. And when I, when I, the question I had for him was, why do you think you get in trouble so much in school? He said, because I can't read that well. So I act out so the teacher won't call on me. And what we know is that when kids present with behaviors in the school, ultimately they meet this gentleman with those same behavioral challenges outside of the school and they end up in prison or dead. Thank you, Samina. <laughs> Questions for the mayor. When are we going to actually have something in the city to occupy the idle time of the youngsters and teens? We passed a millage and nothing was done with it. So the question is concerning youth centers. Yeah. That's a very, very important point. It's something we take very seriously as I think everyone in this room is aware of. A youth recreation millage was passed almost four years ago now. And, uh, nothing really came of that. Uh, and uh, I've been in office now for a little less than three months. We're diligently working on putting in place a plan and proposal that we'll be bringing to city council in the next couple of months uh, for a permanent long-term location, uh, at least one location, a uh, permanent long-term location for a youth recreation program and youth enrichment uh, program uh, this is long, long overdue, uh, and you know I can't speak to what what transpired under the previous administration, uh, but now it's up to us as the mayor and city council to move forward quickly and diligently, which is why we've been looking and we've been doing this for two or two and a half months, really since I immediately came into office. We've been looking for a permanent location. I've already toured a number of possible facilities in the city. Uh, for acquisition to locate a long-term permanent youth rec, youth enrichment program in. 
Uh, we've been uh, clear that our timeline is to make sure that we have a specific proposal before council no later than June of this year. I think we're on track to do that. And in the interim, what we've done is we have programs at Harrington Elementary School in partnership with the school district. Those are youth enrichment programs, art, music, after school tutoring, dance classes. And in addition, in partnership with the Oakland Sheriff PAL program, the Police Athletic League, we have athletic programs running at the United Wholesale Mortgage UWM Sports Complex. Uh, and uh, we encourage you to spread the word about those programs. We have additional capacity. We encourage you to encourage folks to sign up to participate in those programs. You can do so by going to the City of Pontiac's website. Uh, but like I said, in terms of a long-term plan that's really now four years overdue, we're going to have a specific proposal before council no later than June of this year. Uh, thank you, Mayor Grimal. Uh, definitely the administration and the council are very concerned with making sure that we build a viable location that our children can come to uh, and enjoy some of um, a lot of different programs within our city. Another important question, um, and it delves into get, getting our communities back to where um, they're safe and, and vibrant. Mayor Grandma, what has been done about the drug dealers in our neighborhoods and the gun violence in the street? And maybe if, if you can't answer that, maybe the Oakland County can, can touch bases on that question as well. I'm, I'm going to defer primarily to the Oakland County Sheriff's Office. I can tell you that whenever we get reports, and by we, I mean those of us at City Hall, and I've been doing this for many years as an elected official when I was a state representative or county commissioner, I immediately provide that information about the location of drug houses to the sheriff's department. And I don't provide names about who brought it to me. I don't even provide those names to the sheriff's department because I want residents to know that they're bringing that information in full confidence. And so when I turn that over to the sheriff's department, I say it came from me. I don't, I don't let even the sheriff's department know who gave the information to me because it's important that our residents know that their anonymity will be protected uh, when the sheriff's department goes after bad actors. All right, violent crime is our number one priority. All right, we're doing everything we can to stop violent crime, you know, working with the community. Uh, we implemented a community um, policing. We have Sergeant James here. Uh, we have six officers assigned throughout the community um, to engage in community policing, but we need your help. If we're gonna stop crime, we need your help. We need to stand together as a community to fight crime. Oh, thank you, sir. It looks like uh, Councilwoman Rutherford has a comment to make in that regard as well. Uh, yes, please. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, Good afternoon everyone. Good afternoon. I think it's important that we can tell the truth about something we don't talk about that's comfortable and that's called snitching. I, say snitching. But I believe it's important that we know that we have police officers who actually catch you through the process of actually telling on someone. Uh, Sergeant Troy, can you raise your hand? Even? So, 2011, Sergeant Troy came to me. Uh, it was a murder on Shirley Street, and he knew I was scared because I'm from that way. And from my way, you don't snitch. And I was like, Sergeant Troy, if this happens, you're going to protect me. And Sergeant Troy said, absolutely. Is that correct, sir? Okay. And so he walked me through the process. The reason why I'm bringing it up is this is very simple. We have to start making people feel like they're going to be protected when they take. And so in the end, somebody got 50 years. We have to keep telling these stories, making people feel comfortable. So my, the reason why I brought it is because we've talked about the no snitch, but we're not talking about the other side, where if you do tell, you are made to walk through the process. I didn't feel alone. I knew how to uh, talk when I was on the stand. And not just that, after he gave me wraparound services, so I knew how to de-escalate when people tried to verbally attack me, and they did for years. But I am literally proof that when you do tell, you don't die. When you do tell, somebody does protect you. When you do tell, you did become empowered, and that's what made me the woman I am today. Thank you. Thank you, Council Woman Relaford. The next question is for Mr. Raheem Harris. How can we set out tonight in our goal for United Pontiac? United Pontiac? All of us coming together as one. 
no color involved. Because a bullet don't got no color. Okay. When the bullet come off that gun, it don't got no color. That's why we got to come universal and come together as one. Uh, thank you. Collective work and responsibility. This is the brother talking about us coming together as a community. I'm opening this up for the full panel. Um, how can we survey our students to determine the types of resources that they will best help them avoid uh, crime? How can we survey our students? I know you guys are on the, on the front line working with our children. So how can we survey our students to determine the types of resources that they may need to avoid crime? So basically asking the youth uh, what they need. <laughs> just want to say something really quick um myself and it's a bunch of us that have been working with oakland um university to trying to um make sure that every student in the city of pontiac received the asa um test which is um adverse childhood experiences and that would be one way that we can get those numbers and see how um, <clears throat> traumatic some of these kids are actually living. You, like you're talking about going home and it's the dark home or something, I think someone said, um, just seeing how much uh, trauma that they are facing. And then we could um, match them with the resources that we, we offer in the community. All right, thank you. If I could add to that, we know that, you know, poverty is one of the best indicators of crime. Poverty is one of the best indicators of the outcome of crime. And in order to reduce poverty, the best thing that we can do is make sure that we are providing our youth with a quality education. And that starts in the home. It starts before they get in the school. It starts with reading every day to your child 20 minutes a day from the moment you bring them home. And I think that, you know, in order to alleviate the challenges that we have in our community, we have to start by improving uh, the quality of education that our young people have. Mayor Grimal. The community wants to know, do we have a monthly newsletter? We don't. Uh, and we, we really, uh, the city has not had one uh, for many years. It's actually uh, in uh, the works right now. We're in discussions with uh, some uh, of the city council members. We do have a city council subcommittee regarding communications. And it's one of the things we're looking to put together. Uh, we, uh, at least uh, the city itself, has not had a monthly newsletter in, I don't even know how long, probably 20 years. Uh, there has been a, a piecemeal approach in the past where the city clerk has sometimes sent out something or the mayor's office has sometimes sent out something. We, we know the library has sent out uh, newsletters. We really need to come together and have one city newsletter that allows space for, for different elected officials to share information, but more importantly, just shares information from the city as a unified body about what's going on in the community and about opportunities that residents can tap into and resources they can tap into through the city. Uh, and so we're aware of, of the past challenges and absence of meaningful communication, and we're working diligently to remedy it. Uh, thank you, Mayor. It's actually a lot of questions for you, so. Um, <laughs> can we have a de uh, de-escalation class in the city of Pontiac and teach problem solving? Ab <laughs> Absolutely, and, and that's uh, an important idea, one that we, we have been thinking quite a bit about. Uh, my own view is that the city itself, meaning city government, may not be best situated to lead that or facilitate that. Uh, but the city, in partnership with some nonprofits, 
can facilitate those classes. And that's really essential. I mean, there's nothing more basic in terms of avoiding violence than making sure that conflicts, when they occur, are de-escalated and don't spiral out of control to turn into violence. And that's what de-escalation classes are all about. Thank you, Mayor Grimal. Mr. Leah Sharp. Just to add on to that, uh, we do have the lovely CEO, what are you? Executive Director of Healing Heart Safety, which off, uh, um, offers active shooter courses, which is a little different than the ACE, uh, the ALICE drill, which is because it teaches what to do if faced with a shooter, bleeding control, and also tourniquet use if shot. So raise your hand, Denise Harris. It's the uh, AVERT drill. We, um, with our kids out here, we got Moms Demand Action. They give out free gun locks. Please tap into them because we all need gun locks. And we need to learn how to be safe with our guns. So let's quit leaving these guns around and let's lock them up so our kids can be safe at home. Oh, thank you. That was a great answer to, to, this, to that question. I'm sorry. Okay. All right. I am a village. <laughs> Look, in regards to de-escalation, like I said before, I'm in a training with, with, the, with the shares. We're actually trying to get a grant. No, they getting a grant, a 1033 program, so we can start teaching de-escalation and training in the community. The program that I'm in now, this is the first one. So we're actually trying to get more funding to add, add more program, and we're going to have a chosen few from the community to be part of this so we can take that information back to the community and so y'all can see through the lenses of the police but they also see the lenses where we coming from so we will have some training de-escalating training in the future with the share to teach us and that we can learn de-escalation and learn how to build that relationship together i just wanted to touch on that we all in that group. Thank you, Mr. Burroughs. I'd like to call Commissioner uh, Angela Powell to the, the podium, please. Good evening, everyone. Um, I'm so happy that we are having this discussion. It was well overdue, well needed for us to meet with the community, especially from the elective front. But what I also wanted to let you all know is when Sheriff Bouchard switched from Pontiac Police and we shifted to the Sheriff Department, he implemented a group called the Sheriff Relations, Sheriff Relations Team. That is served with community activists, leaders, pastors, organizations, nonprofit, business members. We're all at this table. Now, we just recently, let me remind you all too, Mayor Grimal just got in and he just started January 4th. I need to stress that to everybody, January 4th. So the good thing is he's taking initiative and starting early to at least hear our concerns and start putting things in place. So I have to keep reminding our community, January 4th, we were not, and I say we because I am his team partner in this, 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 this new movement we got going with this city. But back to what my original why I'm here. The Sheriff Relationship Team was created. All those partners are there. The reason why Sheriff Bouchard put us all in place to avoid that snitching thing. Because guess what? Just like Rep. Grimal said, I worked with him when he was a state rep, and I can vouch that police, the Sheriff Department don't ask. Now, why one I owe the question on who told us what when we called them and let them know there's a drug house on such such street. We heard that this person may be here or this is going on. They don't care about who told us. So that privacy that we and that, that trust we have to build with our community in every sheriff relationship team, we will roll out and let you all know who those people are. Because yes, we do know that some of you in the community, y'all ain't trying to talk to no police, we get that. But I'm a snitch. I'm telling, I let everybody know, I'm telling. Why? Because I don't want to live, I don't want to live knowing that this person got a, uh, uh, what's them guns, a rifle or whatever, and ain't nobody saying that. No, I'm going to call the police and say such, such got a rifle in that house. 
So when all those shooters, and I'm going to say this, we amped up the sheriff department. Thank you. Because when all that stuff happened in Oxford, I'm going to say this to y'all. I told that sheriff department, when I came and asked for a share, uh, 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 no, uh, community resource officer for our school district, because if y'all remember, we made the news. It was a lot of rights, a lot of stuff going on. Oakland County, and I'm very transparent because I want to let y'all know this. Oakland County gave me a hard time to really give me an officer, but y'all know I fought and I got that officer, that extra officer for that school district. So when all that stuff happened in Oxford, and we poured a lot of money. The Oakland County government poured a lot of money to assist in that situation. And I want to thank our sheriffs because I made the statement that I should not have to ask for one iota thing if we have any more violence in my city. You want to know why? Because them spraying, them drive bags, that happened all last summer, all last year. They was trying to figure out, but guess why they couldn't solve it? Guess why? Guess why the sheriff's office couldn't solve it? Because we wasn't talking. So when... I am the village say, it's our time to talk. We have to start talking. When that happened in Spring Lake, I remember, I was in Tennessee and I got a call that it looked like Christmas lights in Spring Lake or something because that shooting happened and them three guys died. But ain't not an I older person say anything about any of them other shootings that happened over there. So what I'm going to say today if y'all have community leaders that want to be the snitches for you, we're going to let y'all know everybody's name on that list because we revamped the list. And we are partnering with the city of Pontiac to roll out a bunch of meetings on a monthly basis moving out. But again, he just got there January 4th. But the, the, the setup, the schedule, everything is coming. And start talking. Because I am. And if y'all want to give my number and tell them to call me, I will be the whistleblower. Okay? Call me. Angela Powell. So just know that all that stuff is in place. That sheriff department, our sheriff department, I call them, they tell me everything. We got a good sheriff department that care about us here. They do their part. Now we got to do ours. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Commissioner Powell. We got a few more questions, um, and most of them are geared towards the mayor. Guess y'all really want to hear from the mayor tonight. <laughs> and I don't, maybe he can answer this question, or maybe not. Um, what plans do the owners have for the empty schools? That's supposed to me. Yes, it's yeah. supposed to you. That's well, why I said you, you may, yeah, maybe I, have to answer I, that I question. Can't. You know, I can't get in the, the minds of other people uh, and speculate as to what they want to do. Uh, a couple of the owners of the schools have approached us uh, and have discussed uh, possibilities in terms of some housing uh, developments, uh, but uh, those are really early conversations. And uh, there are some schools that the uh, owners have, in fact, uh, taken some steps to, to redevelop. I think everyone, well, maybe not everyone, but most people are familiar with some of the plans around Webster Elementary, for example, with Micah 6. Uh, so that's uh, in the process of being redeveloped as a community center uh, that will allow for a number of tenants to, to move in there to provide community services. Uh, the old uh, Central High School, of course, is owned by Lee Industrial, and they use it for some degree of training and apprenticeship programs. Uh, but I, I don't think people are probably asking about those uh, buildings, but about the many other uh, school buildings that were sold by the school district to private owners and are still sitting vacant today. Uh, we are, like I said, I have had some conversations with some of the owners about redevelopment. Uh, but you'd have to ask the owners about what their plans are in terms of specifics. Uh, thank you, Mayor Grimo. What investment support and structures can the city provide to organize and develop block clubs and, and, and booster communities? I, I think quite a bit, actually. I mean, one of the things we're working on is bringing back in-house to the city our community development block grant dollars that the emergency manager sent over to the county many, many years ago, 10 plus years ago. Uh, and we're trying to bring those dollars back in house. We're optimistic that we will be able to do so. Uh, so that's an exciting opportunity to better direct those dollars. And one of the things those dollars could potentially be used for is to do some of those neighborhood 
uh, building exercises where we make sure that we're building neighborhood organizations that will actually make our neighborhood stronger and connect families with one another. And that certainly includes things like block clubs, and includes things like neighborhood watch organizations. Uh, but another thing uh, that, that we can do even before that is work with some of the community policing team members of the sheriff's department to help uh, staff and provide some technical assistance to actually help get some of those organizations off the ground when it comes to neighborhood watch organizations. Uh, and some of those organizations can be done, some of those, those community development work can be done in conjunction with neighborhood associations and uh, involve the development of neighborhood associations themselves. Uh, thank you, uh, Mayor Grimal. This question is for uh, Pastor Jones. What can the churches do or what resources can the churches do to bring to the table to help us end violence in our community? Um, let me say that the churches are already doing a lot right now. I heard someone say the churches ought to open up. Um, power company. 300 kids are better. They're already doing it, day in and day out. Um, as I said here, Welcome Baptist, there are 200 kids right now working athletics. Uh, that The job that Tanisha Taylor does with the POW program and request is she takes kids that are three and four years old and have groomed them and developed them, many of them now going off to college. Some of them are already in college. The success that that young lady is doing with those kids in that church is unbelievable. And that range anywhere from 100, 200 kids a week there. Bishop Lee, Bishop Lee on the north side of the city uh, has opened up her church, summer programs, winter programs that are there. The churches are open and doing. Uh, Fresh Presbyterian Church with the training program they had, I, Chris Johnson at the Episcopal Church. Not only doing the feeding programs or whatever, but they're doing a lot of, of programs right now for the kids because we know that the school that the city did not have the uh, recreational facilities for them. So the we're already doing it, but we want to continue doing it, and we are. And so we said to the city, to the to the mayor, tell us what you want, we'll do it. Uh, new prospect under Pastor Derek McDonald is educating kids when the kids were out because of COVID, opened up his church, special classes. Pastor Parker at his church, New Springfield, special educational classes. So when you ask for us to church again, we're right there and we've been there and we will be there. And in this, we want you to know we are your partner. And we want to be your partner. And I, I, I'm going to tell you, I'm excited about being pastor in a church in a city like this. This question is for Mayor Grimal. Can the city provide gun safety classes for adults and kids? Absolutely. And, you know, I've been in touch actually with uh, our state legislators who, uh, and, and I, many of you are familiar with them, but for those who aren't, uh, we're represented by State Representative uh, Brenda Carter and State Senator Rosemary Bayer, uh, and they happen to be the chair and vice chair of the Firearm Safety and Violence Prevention Caucus in Lansing. And so uh, they have some connections uh, with groups that can do some of this gun safety training uh, and that's very, very important, particularly when it comes to preventing accidental uh, gun deaths. Uh, you know, when, and these situations have occurred here in Pontiac over the years. We haven't had a situation like this uh, this year, uh, fortunately. Uh, but we see these incidents on the news all the time where there's a gun left loaded uh, without the safety on that's not in a locked place. A child gets to it and accidentally shoots themselves. Uh, and so it's those kinds of accidental deaths that gun safety classes are designed to avoid and prevent. Uh, and there are uh, some resources and groups that engage in that kind of training that the city can help coordinate. Uh, thank you, Mayor Grimal. 
just a few more questions and because uh, I want really want to respect everyone's time tonight. Um, is the city looking at or pursuing any kind, any kind of community-based violence prevention programs that assist in decreasing incarceration in our, in our community? Well, yes, uh, is the short answer, and that's why we're all here. It's why the city council and, and I, as the mayor, are putting in place an anti-violence commission uh, because the way to reduce incarceration is to reduce the incidence of crime. That's what we have control over here in the community is actually preventing violence from occurring, reducing crime from occurring. Uh, in terms of, of those who are apprehended uh, for acts of crime, whether or not they end up getting incarcerated is beyond the control of us as city officials. That's left up to the sheriff's department and the prosecutor's office and judges. Uh, but we're focused on trying to reduce violence in the community, trying to reduce crime. Uh, and that's exactly what we're all working on together. And that's why we're all here tonight. One of the other areas that we want to ramp up our efforts in is reducing recidivism and making sure that returning citizens who have been incarcerated are connected with those resources that they need to uh, rebuild their lives in a constructive, productive way that does not lead to destructive behaviors that will or could end up in them ending up back in incarceration. But the answer is yes, to make a long story short. Uh, thank you, Mayor Grimal. And one final question. When would a crime task for, uh, for start? Right, yep. now. right. so we've, we're going to be making and finalizing those appointments this weekend. Uh, and that task force, that commission is going to immediately get to work. So once those appointments are finalized, which will be in literally the next few days, we will be announcing the members of that commission at Tuesday's city council meeting. And that commission is going to immediately get to work. Uh, so as we close the section of the, of the program where we ask this panel, uh, questions from the community. Some of the things that radiate from the answers from uh, this distinguished panel was, how do we strengthen our family structure? They also talked about self-accountability and saying that it's our responsibility to not be on the sidelines, but be involved in our community to, to help us move past this uh, situation as well as reduce the crime in our neighborhoods. We also talked about the culture of poverty and it affects the culture of poverty. So please think as we leave here, how do we change the culture of poverty in our community? We talk about ownership. Yes, this city, every individual in this city, every elected official, every activist, those that are not engaged, that need to be engaged, we have to take ownership of what's happening in our community. Loving each other. We have to get back to self-love in our community. Too many times self-destruction and self-hatred takes over our community. So we have to get back to loving each other, right? Last night at the council meeting, I talked about uh, fading, fading back, fade back. We have to learn to deal with each other. Every situation that we have with each other doesn't have to be a hostile situation. Somebody has to take responsibility to just fade back, right? Take a step back and say, oh, that's my brother. That's my sister. That's my neighbor. We ain't got to go at each other like this, right? At this time, I want to call back to Mika Ramsey. She's been a great co-moderator. Give her a hand. And we're going to talk about next steps. Thank you. I want to give a round of applause for uh, Council Pro Tim Carrington as well. Yeah. Once again, it takes people with lived experience to be able to talk about things. Um, when I was a little kid, my dad, God rest his soul, because I wouldn't be telling the story if he was alive, was a drug dealer, got shot and called my stepmom to pick him up from a bad drug deal and take him to the hospital with me and my little sister in the car. I was like seven or eight. I know this. This, is, this has been my reality. We lived in Spring Lake and, and somebody got jumped in front of our house and stabbed. And my, my younger sister and my older sister saw it and reported it to the police. 
I don't want my kids to grow up in that same environment. It is our responsibility, each one of us. And I'm telling people, this, this is my thing. This off script, Tim is not, uh, Mayor Grimel does not approve of this message. <laughs> Listen, if your kid acting up, if your grandkid acting up, if your niece or nephew acting up and you allow that, you're not welcomed in our community. Because you're allowing it to happen. If my son, who is 26, did something wrong, I'm turning him in. As a, a, as a parent, as an involved citizen. So when these mamas and these grandmamas and these daddies and uncles know their kids or grandkids or family members out here doing wrong and still want to be a part of our community, we don't want you. No more. We don't want you. No more. We have to start holding each other accountable. Mm -hmm. And if, the, if we can't hold the kids accountable, like Norb said, we got to hold the, the family accountable because my kids ain't, my, my son is 26, 6'3", right, 200 pounds, and he in the community and they be like, your son be acting right because I still will go off on him if he don't. It doesn't matter. And if we don't continue to hold our community responsible, listen, I love my kids and I did the best I could to raise them. I know when they get out in that street, they different than the kids that I see in front of me. So when somebody come up to you and say, hey, your kid, don't go off on them. Don't get mad. Listen to what they say. And then you can you can positively correct your kid. But we need that accountability. And without it, the police cannot save us. We have to save each other. We have grandparents that still live here that might be scared to go outside. We have families who don't want their kids to play. How are they being kids if they can't even go outside? We have to be the village. We have to hold each other accountable. And, 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 and like Commissioner Powell said, if you don't feel comfortable, call somebody who do. I'm about that life. Call me. Call me because I'm going to tell on them and then get mad if they come to my face. Right. But that's what we need in order to rebuild this community. We have an amazing group of organizations. Uh, we have Black Youth Votes. If y'all could stand up, please. They have little sheets here. <laughs> So if you are interested in being a part of I Am The Village, if you are interested in learning more about any of these organizations, you sign up over there and they are going to call you and engage you. Because th this is where it starts. It does not stop when this, when this is over. This is where it starts. Raheem wants to start working more with Oakland Forward. We have the co-executive director, uh, Kermit Williams, back there to do neighborhood watches and block clubs. Raheem wants to be proactive, but the first step is to get to know each other again. Who go in their house and close their door and that's it? We don't, we don't know our neighbors anymore. And so Raheem and Oakland Forward want to start that conversation. Dalia does a march every year saying stomp out the violence. Every year she has to have, add another picture and another nameplate that we don't want to have to do anymore. Norbert is going to start holding us accountable. The parents and the grandparents. Samino is working his tail off, right, with his team to not only fund these organizations, because that's one of the things, we don't have money to fund and help build these organizations, but to bring us all together and has been an amazing convener when it comes to so many different organizations trying to do the same thing and he bringing us together to work together. And the Oakland County Sheriff, once again, we have community policing. We have friends on that side. They are not our enemy. And if we treat them like that, our community will continue to hurt. So we need to continue to build into, to flow into, to be a part of, and not after the fact. Don't come to the city council meeting yelling and mad because the mayor and the council didn't do anything. What did you do? What did you do? Don't come up there talking about the sheriff's ain't right. What did you do? And then once you can answer that question with your head held high, then we can talk about what other people are not doing. That's the accountability that this community needs. Whoever killed this baby needs to be in jail now. Right now. Right now. Right now. Somebody knows who did it. We need you to talk. Yeah. 
This family deserves, first, they did not deserve to have to be burying a seven-year-old child. But the fact that they have no closure is like a constant stab in that family. And if we can't do anything else as a community because we cannot bring this baby back, we can give her family some closure. Yeah. With that being said, I want to tell the Pontiac community, y'all took care of Forever 7. Forever 7 raised $20,000 to take care of her. That was Pontiac. That was Pontiac then. I know y'all love her. I know y'all love us. We got to start loving on each other. Thank you. And with that being said, I am going to hand this over to Mayor Grimo for closing comments. But we want to thank every one of you for being here, for staying over, right? Because we did not want to rush this. We want to make sure we're addressing everyone's needs and concerns. I would also like to acknowledge that uh, State Representative Brenda Carter's uh, liaison, thank you, Angie, liaison is here. Jonathan is here. So we want to thank him. We also have Mary Freeman, who is the wife of Andy Levin here, and she called and said, I just want to be here to listen, to hear so that we can help. We have people wanting to step up and help us, Pontiac, but we have to help ourselves first. Thank you. Thank you. Let's give Tamika another round of applause. Over the years, we have seen what seems like a million of these kinds of town halls, a, a million peace marches and rallies to stop the violence. And we didn't hold tonight's event so that people could pat themselves on the back, feel good about themselves, and go on with their lives. We held tonight's town hall so that we could hear constructive feedback and input about concrete next steps because coming out tonight doesn't do any good if all of us do not put what we've heard into action and that's not just action this week or this weekend it's something we need to put into concrete action every day of the year all year round that's what it's going to take to meaningfully reduce violence in the community and it starts, of course, with us at City Hall, with the City Council and the mayor. And I want everyone here to know that we have heard you loud and clear. We understand the urgency of youth recreation programming. We understand the urgency of de-escalation classes. We understand the urgency of gun safety programs. And most of all, we understand the urgency of restoring hope in our community. But it's about more than just elected officials. It's about more than just those of us at City Hall. It is incumbent on everyone in this room, everyone who's watching, everyone in the community to put these thoughts, these nice sentiments, these great ideas into action. Because that's the only way this is gonna work. And so as we close out, I just wanna emphasize, yes, Enough is enough. Yes, we cannot have any more Arias in our community. Yes, we've got to make sure that we don't have to have more funerals for children here in Pontiac. But let's actually make that happen. Let's make that our new reality. Let's invest in ourselves and make sure that we have a community that provides the safety and security that everybody in Pontiac truly deserves. So let's go out after tonight and let's make it happen. Not just tonight, not just this week, but for the remainder of this year and in every year to come. And on that note, I encourage everyone to post some notes on the walls before you leave, some notes that express hope. 
notes that express our vision for the future about what kind of a community we can be, a community that is truly free of this kind of senseless violence once and for all. So please post some of those inspirational messages, not just for those of us in this room, but we will take photos of those messages and we will get them out on social media and other avenues to hopefully inspire the entire community about what is truly possible here in our beloved Pontiac. Thank you all for coming out tonight. Can Mayor Brown provide your community, your public email, so if they find it, think of something after this meeting, you can email Mayor Brown and he'll get it to the leaders here if you want to partner with them. But we'll have one place all these concerns are coming to you. Absolutely. So it's, it's pretty simple. It's Mayor, M-A-Y-O-R, at Pontiac.mi.us. So mayor at Pontiac.mi.us. So absolutely, if anyone here thinks of some additional concerns, anyone here or suggestions, anyone here wants to connect with some of these great community partners who are present, shoot us an email and we'll make sure that we get your question answered. If it's a question, that we incorporate your input and comments into our next steps and that we connect you with all the great players and community activists who want to make change for the better here in our city. Thanks. So before everyone leaves, once again, our black youth votes have the sign up sheets. If you are interested in getting more information from any of these organizations here, Delia. Hello, hello, hello. Can I get your attention?